All right. Good to see everybody this morning. Everybody doing good? All right. It's so good to see you. He's glad he's not preaching. I'm just glad I didn't have to do all those announcements. So uh, that was a good trade. I'll take that trade any day. Um, all right. Go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we've been in a series on the Beatitudes, um, the beginning of Jesus' uh, um, first sermon, big sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And, um, and so we are going through each of the Beatitudes. We're taking a week to go through each one. And so this morning, uh, the, the message is blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. So, so let's read all of the Beatitudes together. There's, uh, there's eight here. And, um, and so they're going to be on the screen. I always encourage you to bring your Bibles, but I want us to read them out loud together. So let's read from the screen so we're all on the same translation. This is from the New King James. Um, and so it says, Matthew 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, uh, his disciples came to him, and then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor, pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, so put verse 4 back up there again. Here's, here's the one we're doing today. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, as, isn't that an interesting verse? I just think that's an interesting verse. Uh, that word blessed, we look, some translations have happy. Um, it almost looks like happy are the sad, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Um, but as we've learned that uh, last week, that the word blessed and happy here is, is, is a word that, that it's not based on happenings. It's not based on circumstances. It's an inner contentment. It's an inner joy. Uh, the world can't give it to you, and the world can't take it away. It's something on the inside that no matter what you're going through, that you can have this place, this this. Uh, this environment of happiness on the inside. Um, and Jesus teaches us here that even for those who mourn, that they'll find comfort. And just, just that verse itself, blessed are those who mourn, tells us, Jesus is telling us, look, there are going to be times that you're going to mourn. That being a Christian doesn't exempt you from problems, doesn't exempt us that, oh, if you'll just follow Jesus, and if you got enough faith, then you'll never go through anything. That's not what it says. It, he says, no, there, there is going to be loss. There is going to be things that's going to happen. But there's a promise of comfort. There's a promise of still being blessed in the middle of our pain. Uh, I'm wondering here, how many of you have a scar somewhere on your, you have a scar? All right. Uh, how many of you, your sibling gave you that scar? Anybody? All right, all right. We'll have a little forgiveness session later. I hope you've let that go. Uh, bicycle scars, anybody? Auto wreck? Okay. Surgery? All right. Um, a lot of scars in the room. A scar, I was thinking about this, a scar is a wound uh, that is healed properly. You know, when you, you remember when it was a wound, when it was wound, you didn't, you didn't want anybody touching it, you didn't want anybody near it. Um, you didn't want mom to put peroxide on it or anything else. You wanted everybody, you just you, get away from me. But now you look at it, and most days you, do, you, know, you probably don't even think about it. But, um, but when you look at that scar, it's just a reminder of something that you've been through. And, and what the Bible is teaching us here is that, that uh, there is healing for our wounds. Uh, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Right, that there is comfort and healing for our, our wounds, the things that we go through in life, that you can get to the place that though it was a traumatic experience, though it brought, it, it, was, it was bad enough that it made you mourn, that it, you, it was a place that you just wondered if you could get through, that the promise is there will be a day that you can look back on that time and it's just a, a scar. It doesn't hurt like it used to hurt. 
The memory is there, but the pain is better than it used to be. Um, because Jesus heals the brokenhearted. But in order to be comforted, we have to receive the comfort. So the, the promise of comfort is there, but it has to be received um, when it's offered. And so he says, he says, blessed are those who mourn. And I was thinking we can mourn, we can grieve over many things. It, it could be the loss of a job, you know, the loss of a business. Um, could be the loss of a home in a tornado. Uh, Ray was just talking about somebody who, who has uh, suffered loss in both of the last two tornadoes. How about that? You lose one and you just get it rebuilt and then you lose another. How many know you don't quickly get over that? There's the loss of your, the things, your, the things that were valuable to you and memorable things. Maybe it's the loss of a marriage or the loss of a pet, um, the, the loss of friends, you know, after a bad situation, maybe a church split, maybe you've gone through that and you're like, you're, you're suffering the loss of the, what used to be in that church, what, whatever it is. Um, maybe you're mourning from pain that, or hurt that was caused to you by someone who was close to you and you're still trying to get over that. Maybe it's the loss of a reputation. Um, maybe you really messed up and you're still kind of mourning the loss of what used to be. I, I think one of the hardest things to recover from, and it's the one that I want to focus on this morning, is the loss of a loved one, because it's one, that's one, the loss of a loved one will affect every single one of us in this room. If, if, it, if you've never experienced that, and Jesus tarries, if he doesn't come back here soon, then we all will experience that at some point or the other. And so I want to look at this one because most of you have experienced that. Um, and if you haven't, you will. And, and so we want to learn how to take comfort in that. I remember we went through a season as a church that, um, uh, for me, a season from the end of 2017 to uh, there in 2020 when um, I was, it was a season of mourning. Um, because as a pastor, it, it was like People, first it started with the death of my father, and then people who were really close to me um, and people in the church were passing. It almost, if you were here during that time, it was almost like I was afraid for anybody to join the church because it was like people were falling, you know, they were, they were going. And I was like, what in the world is going on? And so my dad passes, and then we had a couple elders, Brother Leonard, Brother Stan, pass away. And then, and then, but then there were crazy things. I mean, they had been sick. We were kind of knew that was coming. But then crazy things. You know, Holly's husband, Russ, just out of nowhere, wasn't expecting that. Cecil's wife, Judy, just in the middle of the night, wasn't, wasn't expecting that. Um, Steve Boren starts this ministry, and he's so excited, and we're, we're kicking it off. He's built a team in a Freedom 418, and we had T-shirts, and we had a team ready. We're ready to kick it off. He's great, and then all of a sudden, he feels a little sick, sick and two weeks later, he's gone. And, and I, I got to where I was afraid of the phone ringing, like, who's next? We, we had a lady that, that I grew up with, or, or I knew, I've known her all my life. I didn't grow up with her. She was older than me, but I'd known her all my life, Carolyn Bass, who's sitting in her living room at home, and a truck comes through her living room and hits her in her, in her recliner. And this was like, like happening like left and right, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so, but it was in this season that I put this verse. I'm like, either the Bible's real or it's not. I mean, I'm mourning here. Is there really comfort for those who mourn? And I'm here to tell you that God uh, got us through. And, and there, was, there was comfort in that season. There was a peace that it passes understanding. And so I just want to tell you, this is real. It works. And one of the passages that I went to a lot, because I did a lot of funerals, uh, is here in 1 Thessalonians 4. And I want you to turn there, 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, because this is a passage that, that can give you comfort when you're going through great loss. Uh, use this at a lot of funerals. Let's, let's look at this. Um, Paul writing to the church, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. The Bible uses the word asleep for when we die because death really, for the believer, Jesus said, he who believes in me will never die. Right, So the Bible uses the word asleep, that they fall asleep, they've gone to be with the Lord. He said, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord's the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, he's saying, look, in this passage we just read is the secret to comfort. It's it's where you're going to find the comfort that Jesus promised for those who mourn. It's right here in this passage. And so I want us to learn, take just a few minutes, let's learn how to take comfort and find comfort in our mourning. Are you all ready? Number one, write this down. Find comfort in the hope of heaven. It, when, you're, when you lose a loved one, and, and, and that's, that term itself isn't a good term, but when, when a loved one passes, um, it's normal for us to sorrow, but not as those who have no hope, because there's a heaven. <clears throat> Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 13. He says, I, I, I want to talk to you about those who've fallen asleep, about those who've gone on to be with the Lord. He, he said, I want to talk to you about that, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. <clears throat> have, have you ever been to a funeral of a family and you could tell that nobody in the family knew the Lord? It is the most depressing thing. I've done, I've done a lot of funerals. Um, and, and I've been to funerals of Christians, and it was kind of a celebration of life, and it hurt, but, it was, but there, was some, there was some joy in the midst of it. We'd even, uh, so I've been to some funerals where we worshiped and we praised and we did those things. And then other times I get called because I'm a pastor and I might know somebody or a distant relative, and they say, hey, will you do this funeral? And the person doesn't know the Lord. Nobody in the family knows the Lord. I remember one situation. I'm, I'm, I'm asked to do a funeral. It's actually a distant relative. And, and I'm there. And, um, and it was just, there was no hope in the room at all. And, and I remember the, the mom, and she was a short, statured lady. And, and the, the, the coffin is there. And her loved one is there in the coffin. And, and as she's trying to, she's just trying to get it. She almost knocks the coffin off the, the platform. And it's shaking, and we all run to it. And, then, and it's, just, it's just sad. It's like, can't let go. And, and then, and then we, I sit down, and I'm, I'm in the uncomfortable spot. I hate this spot, to be honest with you, where I'm in front. I always ask them, do I have to sit like there, because everybody's just looking at you. You know, you're just kind of sitting there in the front and, and, and there, and, and then they start playing the songs, and you just have to listen to the song. Then I remember at this funeral that the song they chose was uh, Imagine by John Lennon. Now, y'all may like that song, but can I help you? Don't use that at a funeral, please, especially if I'm the one. In fact, ask me before you pick your songs. So what do you think of this one, Pastor Joy? Because it gets really awkward because they might have loved that song. That was their favorite song. But do y'all know that song? Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. I mean, imagine there's no heaven at a funeral. Are you serious? And so all of a sudden, my message just changed. I'm like, y'all can imagine all you want. Uh, But there is a heaven. John Lennon had an imagination, but the Apostle John had a revelation. And what we need is not an imagination, but a revelation that there is a heaven. And in, in Revelation 21, John in the Spirit says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Come on, look at this promise. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and thankful. Come on, how many of you are thankful for a heaven, that there is a heaven? And, and so when you believe this, this, the truth of God's word, that there is a heaven, and what, what Paul says here in Thessalonians, that when our loved ones pass, he says that they're with the Lord. So when your loved one passes, you can take comfort if they're a believer in knowing that they're with the Lord. Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring what? With him, those who sleep in Jesus. Well, if God's going to bring them with him, where are they? This, this isn't hard. All right, let's just try this again. If God's going to bring them with him, then where are they? They're with him. Right? It, it's, in fact, again, the word, I, I lost a loved one. We say that term. I use that term. We, we lost them. Listen, it's not a great term because they're not lost. Come on, I didn't lose my father. I know exactly where he is, right? He's with the Lord. The, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. In other words, we have the Lord in our hearts, but not, not like it's going to be in heaven where he's wiping away tears and he's in the flesh, you know, we're there seeing him face to face. He says, now we walk by faith, not by sight. Um, but we're confident. I'm confident of this thing. Yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is that when you take your last breath on earth, you're taking your first breath in heaven. That there's no, no middle ground. It's, it's when, that, when that breath leaves, if you've ever been with somebody when they pass over, you know when they pass over. In fact, I don't even think sleeping is a good verse. I mean, it's in the Bible, so I guess it's good. But, but it, you, you know as soon as you see them, they're not asleep. Their spirit has left. They have gone to be with the Lord. And can I tell you, it's better. Jesus, when he was next to the thief on the cross, he, he said, he said he, he asked him, he said, would you, would you rescue me? And, and Jesus said, listen, I'll tell you this. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Come on, when you think about heaven, I want you to think paradise. Does anybody ever feel sorry for somebody when they go to vacation to Hawaii? You're not feeling sorry for them. You're thinking, I can't wait to get to see them. I wish they'd invited me. Wouldn't it be great if they said, hey, here's a ticket. You can come. And that, that's the way we have to view heaven is that it, it's, we don't want to bring them back because they're in paradise. They're, they'd be mad if they came back. I heard a minister at a funeral the other day say this. He said, as you mourn, remember this, that your worst day is their best day. Come on, your worst day, the day that that, you, that, that loved one passed, that, that child uh, unexpectedly went to be with the Lord, that, that day that spouse passed on, that mother or father, your worst day was their best day. We, we use the word die, it's, it's really not a good word because Jesus said, he said, if you believe, he who believes in me, though he dies, he will live. And he, said, he went on to say, he said, in fact, he who believes in me will never die. You'll, you'll never see death. Your body will, 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 will just exchange that one for a new one. And your spirit lives forever. <clears throat> Billy Graham once said, one day you'll hear the news that Billy Graham has died. Don't you believe it for a minute? I will never be more alive. Here, here's the, so the first one is we take, we take comfort in knowing they're with the Lord. Here's the second thing is you can take comfort in knowing that you'll see him again. So it's not, listen, it's not goodbye, it's I'll see you later. No, notice what he says in verse 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who are asleep, those who've already gone to be with the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, they're already with the Lord, but their bodies, they're going to get new bodies, 
in, 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 the, in the, resurrect, the rapture of the church. And, and so their bodies are raised up. Then look at this, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Everybody say it with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So listen, this isn't the end, everybody. If your loved one has passed, has gone to be with the Lord, there will be a day, according to God's word, that you will see them again, that we will join with them together in heaven. I I, I take comfort in knowing that, that, that my loved ones, that I'm gonna see them again. In, a, in paradise, we got, a, we got an appointment in paradise for eternity. Bob Russell, who's coming in a few weeks, he, he, he tells the story of a 90-year-old man. When he, was, when he was a younger preacher, Bob's, Pastor Bob's 80 now, but when he was a younger man, he tells the story about a man who was in a men's Bible study, and he was 90 years old. And so they're talking about these things, and they've got this 90-year-old gentleman there, and they, they said, hey, do you, do you ever think about dying? And he said, well, yeah, I think about it a lot. And they said, well, what are your thoughts? He said, I'm actually pretty, pretty excited about it. And they were kind of like, really? He's like, oh, yeah. And they were like, well, tell us more. And he said, well, I, number one, I get a new body. I've wore this one out. Right? I'm kind of excited about that. I'm ready for a new body. He said, I, I, I'm looking forward. I think he said, I'm looking forward to seeing my wife. And he said, and not only that, but nothing against you guys, but all my really close friends, they've been up there a long time. He said, in fact, if I don't hurry up, they're going to think I didn't make it, right? It's going, <laughs> you know, so it's like there's, we're going to get to see him again. Listen, everybody, we need to get excited about heaven. The Bible says that these light and momentary afflictions aren't even worthy to be compared, come on, with the glory that's going to be revealed in us when we all get to heaven. Um, in the little church I grew up in, I'm just telling you, people were excited about heaven. They didn't have as much nice stuff as we have today. Maybe that's why. A lot of, old, of the older people had been through World War II. They'd been through the Great Depression. They knew hard times. A lot of them had lost loved ones. And so now I remember the older people in our church, little church, we'd sing the song. We'd sing a lot of songs about heaven. And when we start to sing about heaven, the atmosphere changed. It, it was... Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Now, y'all might have sang that in your church. And I don't know if you were in a Methodist church or Baptist church, or what kind of church. We were in a little spirit-filled church. And when we sang, when we all get to heaven, they sang it like they'd been there. Like, like I'm ready to go back. Like, like they were actually excited about it, and the music would get going, and the worship team would get going, and all of a sudden, people would start clapping. When we all get to heaven. Come on, y'all. Then what a day of rejoicing that will be. Y'all know this? When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Some of y'all look at me like a cow looking at a new gate. It's like... I look at Tom, Tom's like, we didn't do that in the Catholic church. We never sang that song. I don't know. But my, uh, I, my little mamma gent, I'd, I'd take her in, and, and uh, my job was to get her in the car, get her in the building. I'm a you know, young kid, and I'm helping her to the car, and then she'd get in, you know, just shuffling into church like this, and, you know, get, her, get rested, get her stuff, sit down, and then they'd start playing that song. And she start, maybe she's thinking about seeing Papa again. Maybe she's thinking about the daughter that she lost that she's going to see again. Maybe she's just thinking about seeing Jesus. But when she starts, she just, oh, I'd see her start moving. She'd start shaking. <laughs> Next thing you know, she's just kind of doing her thing. And she's like, she's not waiting until she gets to heaven to sing and shout the victory. She was just thinking about heaven and the promise of heaven brought comfort to her mourning. I'm just telling you, there's the hope of heaven will, will change you. Here, here's the second one. So first of all, everybody, we're going to find comfort in just knowing that heaven is for us. The second, we find comfort in the comforter. Jesus in John 14 said this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. 
believe also in me. Here he goes talking about heaven again. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't it amazing? It took God six days to create the earth, but yet for a couple thousand years, Jesus has been up there getting your place ready. Oh, you don't know how it's going. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. And he says, I'm preparing heaven. Heaven's coming. But, but for now, he goes on right after this in verse 16. He says, here's what I'm going to do now, though. While I'm preparing heaven for you, I will pray the Father, and he's going to give you another. I use the King James because of this word. I'm going to give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Jesus in heaven preparing, but I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you another comforter to be with you. Even the spirit of truth, who the world can't receive because it doesn't see him. They don't know him, but you know him because he dwells with you and he's going to be in you. Listen, when you're mourning, you need to take comfort in knowing that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the comforter is always with you. In fact, I looked this up in the Greek, the word for uh, uh, blessed are the mourn for they shall be comforted. The word for comforted there is from the same root word that the word for comforter, the para, parakletos. It, it's the same root word. In other words, you, the promise is for comfort. You want to know where it comes from? The hope of heaven. But also he said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And when you lose a loved one or they, go, they, they pass on and go to be with the Lord, he's just, it's just a reminder today that you may go to that empty house and you may be by yourself, but you are never alone. That the Lord is with you. And you can take comfort in knowing that, from, that I'm never alone. I believe David, when he wrote Psalm 23, and he said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It's that comfort of knowing that I'm going through it, but Lord, I know you're there. It's the comfort of knowing that the Lord is with you. He's going to get you through. Here's, here's a third one. Um, God comforts us through others. I think we like the idea that the Lord himself shows up in our lives and, and comforts us in supernatural ways, but, but sometimes the way God comforts us is through other people. Um, you say, no, I just want Jesus to do it. Well, the Bible calls the church the body of Christ, that we're members of his body. So Jesus is doing it. He's just doing it through his body. Um, Look at 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Look at verse 4. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. In other words, that, that God has, some of you in this room, God has brought you through something maybe the loss of a child, and now you're, you, you, you have the scars to prove it, but, but the wound has been healed. It, it's, it's, there, there's always something missing, but at the same point, it doesn't hurt like it first did. And now God is going to use you to minister to somebody else. I, I'll never forget being a, a younger pastor and uh, Brother Stan, uh, <clears throat> his wife of 50 years, Miss Sandy, passed away. And here I am, a young preacher up here giving them all the verses and the hope of heaven and, and comfort of the Holy Spirit and, and all that was like, okay, young preacher, that, that sounds great. I know it's true, but I'm hurting right now. And, and I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit that, to ask if there was anybody else in the room who had, had, had a spouse that had passed, um, if they would come and help me pray. And I don't remember, four or five people came up, surrounded Brother Stan, and here I am standing in front of him, and I just kind of stood back and let them pray, and can I tell you, their prayer was way better than my sermon. 
because what they were giving him is they were comforting him and letting him know, look, we've been through what you're in right now, and we're just here to tell you, you will get through. The Lord will come. He comforted us, and he's going to comfort you. This is your, this is your worst day. It's her best day, but you're not going to be here forever. There is comfort for those who mourn, and a lot of times it comes through God's people. And if you've been through something, listen, don't, God never is going to waste your pain. There's, there's a ministry of scars that, that the scars that you have could be the very thing that God will use to minister to others. Your greatest test may become your greatest testimony. And, and so this morning we're comforted by the hope of heaven. We're comforted by the comfort of the comforter. We're, we're comforted by others who've been through what we've been through. I, I want to close with a, with a story of, um, of David, David the giant slayer, David the king, um, and it's really in his darkest moment. You know, a lot of times we got VBS coming, we, sell, you know, we, we use David and Goliath, and just, you know, David's kind of a hero. Um, he, he was a man after God's heart, he wrote a bunch of, in fact, Psalm 23, which we've been referring to, he wrote that psalm. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. How many have taken comfort in that psalm? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, right? And yet, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, right? It's that we, we've been blessed by the words of David, but I, I want to point you or take you to David's lowest moment. Um, I believe it was one of his lowest moments. Second Samuel 11, uh, David is there, and uh, I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to tell you the story. Second 11, we're not going to, not even to that verse yet. It's going to be a while. Uh, uh, second, second 11, you can, you can yeah, there you go. Second 11, the Bible says this, that at the time that kings went out to war, David stayed home. So the great warrior stayed home. And while he was home, he was where he shouldn't have been. He should have been at battle, but he was at home. And he was out on, he couldn't sleep at night. He gets out on his porch. I've been to where they, they call the city of David, where they believe David's home is. It sits up on the hill. And, and he, was, he goes out on his balcony, the highest place in, in the land, overlooking his kingdom. Should have been at war, but he was at home. It's late at night, and there was a lady named Bathsheba who went up on her roof to take a bath, which wasn't, listen, everybody, should have been fine. Nobody else could have seen her. The, 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 the warriors are gone. David should be at war. So she should be safe. All right? So don't, don't throw shade on Bathsheba. She's just taking a bath and uh, thinking she's private. And David steps out and sees her. He says that he thinks she's very beautiful. He inquires about her and says, who's that? And, and one of his friends says, Oh, that's Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife. Very specific, you can read it. Like Uriah, one of your mighty men, Uriah. Like your buddy, Uriah, that's his wife. Thinking that would deter him. And David, like, bring her to me. One thing leads to another, he sleeps with her. Now listen, he's the king. Back then, she didn't have a whole lot of say in this. She couldn't just say no. It was, he's the king. This is a low, low, low moment for David. He sleeps with her. A um, month or so goes by. She sends note to David, hey, I'm pregnant, and we both know whose it is. And so David's like, oh, this is not good, y'all. This is not good. <clears throat> People find out my reputation is shot. So he devises a scheme. <clears throat> he's, he calls her husband in. Y'all thinking, man, this Bible is interesting. See, I, I want you to read. The Bible is really good, y'all. Y'all are missing out. So, so anyway, he, he calls his, he, he says, send Uriah in from the battle. Calls him in. Uriah shows up, and, and David says, hey, hey, buddy, um, man, I, you, I'm so proud of you. You've been working so hard. I, I just wanted to give you kind of a little uh, a furlough here, just, just a weekend off, and go home and enjoy your wife. And Uriah's like, I can't do that. We're at war, man. I can't enjoy my wife, or we're at war. And David's thinking, well, I did. You know, so anyway, but it's, that's a terrible, that's terrible. And anyway, so awful. So anyway, so, so he won't do it. And so David, uh, 
So David gets him drunk. He still won't do it. And so David's like, this is not good. I mean, eventually he's going to find out that she's pregnant and who the father is. And uh, so he sends him back to battle with a note, and it's actually his death warrant. And he says, he, he says, give this to the general. He goes up, gives the note to the general, and he's, he says, uh, I want you to go in the heat of battle, send Uriah to the front, everybody else back off, and just let him kind of die in battle. And that's exactly what happened. So not only has he slept with his wife, now he's had him murdered and um, had him killed. Why, why did he do he, He's just trying to protect his, he's David. He's David of David and Goliath. He's the beloved king. He's trying to protect his reputation. And then the only problem with that is that God knew. So let's pick up at 2 Samuel eleven twenty six. When Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of her mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Listen, he's still trying to, now he's trying to like play the hero. Well, like, well, yeah, one of my, my mighty men, Uriah, died in battle. And when he came home that weekend, you know, he, now he had a son. But, but I'm going to take her as my wife to do the to do the gentlemanly thing and, and, and to provide for her and raise this child as my own, Try, trying to make it look like it's still Uriah's deal. And, and then, but God knows. And, and so in chapter 12, Nathan comes to David, tells him a story, and, and, and basically calls him out and says, hey, look, God knows what you did, and, and he's not happy about it, and you better repent. And he said, it's all going to be public. And by the way, um, look at verse 14. The son that you just was born to you is going to die. And so after that, verse 15, after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife, uh, that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. And David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood by him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. And on the seventh day, the child died. And David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for he thought, while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. And David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized that the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied. He is dead. Here, listen, I believe that this is David's lowest moment. His, his child has died. He's, he's defiled this woman against her will. He has killed his best friend. She's lost her husband. Now she's lost her child. He's lost his reputation. Come on, for 2,000 years or for thousands of years, people are going to be telling this story. Everybody's going to know about it. Um, we're talking about it today. God put it in the Bible. And, and, and he's mourning the loss of his child. He's mourning the, the, the loss of or the, the situation. He's mourning the loss of his reputation. Have you ever done something so bad and like, I can't believe I've done this and just think, and, and then you wonder, how's he going to get past this? The guy who wrote Psalm 23, that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Is it really true or is that just a catchy song? That the Lord will lead me through the valley of the shadow of death, but he's going to stay with me even when I've blown it big. In his time of mourning, what's he going to do? I mean, this could be the end, y'all. This could be like David like, locks himself in a cave and never comes out again. And like, I can't, I can't show my face. But he does a couple things. And I'm, Becky, you can come. This is going to be quick. He does a couple things. Look at verse 20. This is a big one. It says, then David got up from the ground. He's, he's been weeping. He's been crying. He's been mourning. But he got up. Listen, when you've suffered great loss, maybe it's the loss of your reputation, maybe it's something you've done, or maybe it's the loss of a loved one. At some point, you got to make a decision, am I going to stay here in my pain? 
Or am I going to get up and let God comfort me? The Bible says he got up. He, he goes <clears throat> and he washes and puts on lotions and changes his clothes. And, and, and you say, well, what's such a big deal about that? Listen, if you've ever battled depression or if you've been in a really low place, you know that just getting out of bed, taking a shower, getting out of the house is sometimes all you can do, but, you need, but it starts there. You got to get up. And, and then notice what he does next. He went to the house of the Lord and he began to worship. He made the decision that in the midst of my mourning, I'm going to go to church. I don't really want to go to church. I'd rather just stay in my cave. I'd rather just not talk to anybody. I'd rather not see anybody. I don't want to talk about it. I just, I don't want to be there. But, but if you're going to get past it, there, he, he got up from where he was, cleaned himself up, and he went to church. And then as the music started playing and people are singing, praise, praise the Lord. And you're like, how can I praise? But the Bible says sometimes you have to make a sacrifice of praise. And so singing the song, even though he didn't feel it, but then over time as he began to worship and think about the goodness of God, all my life you've been faithful. And as he began to declare the truth, something begins to happen on the inside of him that God begins to heal his wounds, that he, he looks back over the faithfulness of God and he, he's, he latches on to the promises of God, that, that the hope of heaven, and he begins to think about these things and to the time where he's, his wounds are starting to be healed. And then verse, then and it says he went back to his own house and, 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 and his small group comes to him. And, and he's a king, so it's hard to have just buddies. I mean, he's, his friends are his servants. And, and so they come to him and they begin to serve him food and, and, and they're, just, they're just talking, they're just kind of talking it out. And they said, look, man, we were so worried about you, David. We didn't know if you were going to pull through. And they're like, how? In fact, we didn't even understand. You're, you're weeping while he's alive, but now that he's gone, you're worshiping. You know, what, what's going on? And he made this statement. He said, look, while the child was still alive, I, I thought that God might do something. Who knows? But now that he's dead, why should I go on fasting? I can't bring him back. But notice what he said. I will go to him, but he's not going to return to me. What's he doing? He's focusing on heaven. He's like, look, guys, this isn't the end. I'm going to see him again. He's with the Lord. I can, I'm going to go to him. I'm going to, he, he was latching on to the hope of heaven. And then verse 24 said that David comforted his wife. With the same, the same comfort he received, he went and told Bathsheba, he said, it's going to be all right. I know this looks bad. I know it is bad. This is a bad situation. But my God is a good God. And he's not going to, we're in the ashes here, Bathsheba, but we're not going to stay here. The Bible says he made love to his wife. She gave birth to another son. You know what that son's name was? Solomon. Like the Solomon who wrote the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the Solomon who God used to build the temple. Can I help you? That wasn't David's only son. In fact, that wasn't the son of his. What should have happened would have been his first wife, the one who was Saul's daughter, the wife of the victory, the, the wife of that when he conquered Goliath, that he, his first wife. You know, you would think that God would be like, no, that's the righteous one. That, this other one shouldn't have even happened. I'm going to use the righteous one to bring bring forth my son because David, Jesus is in the lineage of David, but God didn't say, no, we're not going to go down that family line. We're going to go to the Bathsheba line. And she's going to have a son named Solomon who's going to have a son named this and begat this. It's that part you skipped in the book of Matthew that so-and-so begat so-and-so. But you read it, it says, and Jesse begat David and David begat Solomon by Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, in just case you forgot. And what God is saying is that, listen, up from the ashes of your mourning, he's going to make something beautiful out of your situation. That God can take the worst situation 
your hardest day, your worst day, and take, make something beautiful of it, he can turn your mourning into dancing. And here we see Solomon out of this terrible situation rising up from the ashes. In fact, it goes on and says they, they called him Solomon, but God named him, I think it was like Jedediah or something. It means the one God loves. And God redeemed. Come on, he's not just a savior, everybody. He's a redeemer and a restorer. And he's the one who comforts those who mourn. I wonder if you're here today. Um, can, I, can I just ask this? Let's just get real. Is, is anybody here today and you're right in the middle of your pain? You're just, it, it was everything, just coming to church today was kind of like you had to make yourself come. And you, you're in the middle of your pain. You're, you're, you're mourning something, maybe the loss or uh, it could be just a situation that you're still mourning and it was just hard for you to come. If, that's, if, if you're here today, would you just lift your hand? No, I'm not going to embarrass it. I just want you to lift your hand. Anybody? Okay. Keep them up. I, this, these lights. All right. Thank you. There's some in the back. All right. I just want to pray for you right now. Come on, everybody stand to your feet. Father God, we just come to you. Lord, your promise today was for those who mourn that they would be comforted. And, and God, I pray today that by your spirit, you would comfort them. God, that they would find comfort in others, that, Lord, they would realize that you haven't left them, you're always with them, that they'd find comfort in the hope of heaven and knowing that this is just temporary. This world isn't our home. God, I pray that as a church, we can, we can be the church that loves people through it and helps them in their time of mourning. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, um, these promises are for the one who belongs to the Lord. And so if you don't know Jesus today, that it, it, you won't find comfort in these promises that start when you give your life to him. And so if you've never received Jesus, I ask you right now to just, to just invite him into your heart, to, to turn from your sin and to make him the Lord of your life. Admit you're a sinner, put your faith in Jesus and invite him to come in and then follow him for the rest of your days. And then the promises of comfort will be with you. Everybody said, amen. God bless you. One, one other thing before we worship one more time and get ready for a baptism. Um, we have a group called Grief Share. And a, a lady in our church named Karen Woodall, whose husband went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and she found herself in the group that nobody wanted to be in. And, um, but she found comfort from a group, small group called Grief Share, and now she leads that group to help others who have battled that. And so I encourage you, if you need that, um, see us and help us. We want to walk through this season with you. Let's find comfort this morning. Can, can we just, um, one more time, we're going to go to worship. We're going to praise like David. We're going to get up, and we're going to worship the Lord and watch how he brings comfort to your soul. Amen? Come on, give him your best this morning.